Good afternoon, America. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. I am your host, Mark Levine. The United States Supreme Court did what it does at the last week of June. Pretty much every year, it is issued a bunch of blockbuster decisions. Uh, the Constitution requires the Supreme Court to uh, meet once a year. The uh, legislation dating back to, I believe, the Federal Judiciary Act of 1789 says that the Supreme Court begins on the first Monday in October, and they conclude their session at the end of June. And so they usually save their hottest topics, their most difficult topics, for that last week of June. And oh boy, what a week it was. Uh, bad news and good news. Um, on affirmative action, they punted. Affirmative action remains for the day. Uh, I'm worried that it's not going to last into for a few years. We we will get to that, uh, but those that wasn't the big decision <laughs> of of the term. The two big decisions were, of course, the de declaration that the Voting Rights Act is unconstitutional. At least that section that that singles out the states that have racist practices and says that they don't have to. Uh, seek clearance anymore from the Justice Department. They can just go ahead and put up their racist voting practices, and uh, after the election, uh, we would see if we could strike them down. Not a very good decision. The five conservatives against the four liberals. But then, in a surprise to some, but something I predicted right here on the Inside Scoop, uh, the Supreme Court just Wednesday declared the Defense of Marriage Act unconstitutional. That was the act that said the federal government would not recognize the marriages of citizens of the United States if they were gay. Even if the state, and in this case there's now 13 states, uh, Massachusetts, California, New York, Iowa, Minnesota, Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, let's see if I get them all, Connecticut, uh, Maine, the New Hampshire, uh, Maryland, and the District of Columbia. Hope I named them all. I think I got most of them. Anyway, even if though the states, those 13 states and D.C., say that their citizens are equal under the law. Of course, the 13th state was California, added by another Supreme Court decision uh, that came out the same day. Even though those 13 states have as their policy voted in by the legislature or declared by their courts uh, that all citizens are equal under the law and all marriages are equal under the law, uh, the Defense of Marriage Act passed in 1996 said that the federal government would not recognize legal marriages according to the states where those people are legally married if the couple happens to be gay. Uh, the federal government tried to institute two classes of citizenship, uh, two classes of marriages, and uh, the Supreme Court held with the four liberals joined by libertarian Justice Anthony Kennedy that that could not hold. I want to talk over the next couple hours about these Supreme Court decisions and actually give you a little bit of personal history about how all this happened. How did we get here? How did we get to a place where uh, same-sex marriages were unheard of to the fact that we're on the cusp of having them nationwide? And to understand that, you have to understand everything from the civil rights movement and laws that used to exist stopping uh, black and white couples from getting married to, well, the history of gay rights activism. And I um, talk about uh, the small role that I had to play in some of this. What's fascinating about all of this, though, is that I think that if people were not so bigoted and people were not so determined to prevent our rights, we probably wouldn't have achieved as much as we have today. And I'm going to explain how and why uh, in just a few moments. I do want to give you a chance to call in. If you want to join in this conversation, you're always encouraged to call in the Inside Scoop. It's 202-889-9797, 202-889-9797, and you can join in the discussion. So let's go back. Well, we, I don't know how far to go back in time. You can go back to Greek and Roman marriages where same-sex couples got married. Uh, you can go back to a few examples in the Middle Ages. But largely, the gay rights movement began in America around the 1950s when a personal hero of mine, a, a man who went here, came here on the Inside Scoop, just died a couple years ago, uh, Frank Kameny, used to, he had a security clearance, and he was openly gay, and they took away his security clearance and fired him in the 1950s. And he was advocating gay rights way back then, one of the early proponents. Uh, you had, of course, the Stonewall Movement in the 1960s when uh, police broke into bars. In those days, you could still be arrested, uh, put in jail just for being gay. And uh, they fought back against the police, a bunch of drag queens in a bar in Greenwich Village in New York City. Uh, sometimes that's considered the, the beginning of the gay rights movement, though there were all kinds of, of, of uh, uh, societies and so forth that— uh, Mattachini Society, the uh, Daughters of Labitis, I don't remember them all, um, that occurred in the 50s and the 60s. But the marriage rights movement in America began um, around 1970 when a couple in Minnesota 
tried to get married, a male couple. The Minnesota court said they could not, and it went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, yeah, there's no federal issue here. Interestingly, they didn't say that gay people shouldn't have a right to get married. They said there's no federal issue here. Uh, basically, the state of Minnesota can discriminate if the state of Minnesota wants to, which, by the way, is still the law today. Uh, obviously, in 37 states across the United States, uh, states can discriminate and say that gay couples can't marry while straight couples can, and that's still legal. But that decision in the 70s uh, laid the groundwork uh, until you had uh, a really amazing decision in 1984, one that really shocked me. when I, uh, I, In 1984, I remember when this decision came down. I was just a kid. But I remember shocked by the finding by five justices of the Supreme Court that you could put people in jail, put adults in jail for having sex, for having consensual sex, private consensual sex. And the laws at that time were called sodomy laws. And sodomy laws, a lot of people don't know what those are. A sodomy laws a prohibit uh, anal sex. They also prohibit oral sex. And they prohibit it between any two people. In other words, if a man and a woman who are married have oral sex, that was a felony. In Georgia, it was punishable by 20 years in prison. And if you want to know when that statute was written, in Georgia, it was written in 1795. 1795. Not only were there slaves in Georgia in 1795, not only could women not vote in 1795, but white people without property couldn't vote in Georgia in 1795. That was a long time ago. And yet in 1984, what, 30 years ago? Not even? The United States Supreme Court said, yes, Georgia could put people in jail for 20 years if they had oral sex. Just recently, some activists uh, asked uh, Justice Scalia whether he had oral sex with his wife. And he considered that a rude and extremely impertinent question. I don't. I would never ask that question of anyone who felt that it's legal. But if you believe that it's perfectly constitutional to put people in jail for 20 years for having oral sex, then I think it is relevant to ask Justice Scalia whether or not he was committing an act which he believed was fully appropriate as a felony in Georgia. So that was as recently as 1984. And then in the 1990s, uh, we had, well, the first decision that suggested that same-sex couples could marry was a Hawaii decision in 1993, Bear versus Lewin. And in that case, the Hawaii Supreme Court, based on the Hawaii Constitution, said, well, we believe in equality under the law. So why shouldn't same-sex couples have same the right, same rights that opposite-sex couples did? What happened after that? Well, it's all history, and I'm going to get into the specific legal history and also my personal role in this battle. I'm um, talking about that and, of course, leading up to the decisions of the Supreme Court just last week. Again, if you want to join the discussion, it's 202-889-9797. Today, a history lesson, because you have to know how far we've come to understand how far we have yet to go. And I encourage people to call in at 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. We'll be right back right after this. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. My name is Joe Thompson. I'm 29 years old and have a career that I love as a systems analyst. Career. It still sounds cool to say that word. I never could have gotten on this path without a college degree. And if the college me were here, he'd tell you. I never would have gotten to college without Big Brothers Big Sisters. I could have ended up anywhere, on the streets even. But college? Joe Thompson? Not likely. My big brother helped me out. He taught me I could do anything, at a time when a lot of people were saying just the opposite. And to a seven-year-old, that means a lot. My big brother's name is Phil. And Phil is the reason that this seven-year-old grows up to be a systems analyst. Whether you donate money or time, you're helping Big Brothers Big Sisters help a child. And that can last a lifetime. Start something today at BigBrothersBigSisters.org. 
Brought to you by Big Brothers Big Sisters and the Ad Council. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine talking about the history of same-sex marriage. Got to know where we come from before you know how far we've, we've, we've gone and, and where we have yet to go. Of course, uh, just Wednesday, the United States Supreme Court finally held uh, that uh, at least in the 13 states in D.C. where local governments have said gay people have equal rights under the law, that those marriages are not second-class marriages, that the federal government cannot intentionally discriminate against gay people. They have to accept marriages from Massachusetts, just like they accept marriages from Texas. A big moment. Huge moment in American history, in civil rights history, in gay rights. I want to talk about how we got here. So when we left off, I talked about how the state of Hawaii, the Supreme Court there, said that, well, Hawaii gives its citizens equal protection under the law, and therefore... uh, the people of Hawaii have to allow couples to get married, including gay couples. Uh, let me get uh, interrupt here to get a caller on the line. Caller, you're on the air. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Hi, Mark. Hello, Michael. How are you, sir? What's up, my friend? <laughs> this is Michael from the Bronx, uh, uh, one of my most frequent callers. I've yet to think of a good uh, name for you. I, I, I need one, but I'll think of one, Michael. I'll get there. Anyway, uh, you calling to talk about uh, same-sex marriage? Um, absolutely. At least that's one of the topics that came across my mind. All right. I hear you're discussing it. I am discussing it right now. That's true. What was your thoughts on what happened Wednesday? Um, I had mixed reaction, uh, both on the positive um, way, if I can say that. Um, I was definitely in favor of it, even though I'm heterosexual. I'm married, but I'm also African-American, and I have felt the blunt and have seen the blunt of discrimination on the racial sense. So, in a way, I was quite empathetic with um, gays and lesbians with um, the discrimination that they have been going um, through from the predominant right wing, um, right wing, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Field. I could <laughs> say bigots or uh, the Republican Party or conservatives. There's a whole bunch of uh, ways we could yep. fill that in. Yep. Uh, so here's the thing that I found most. Um, well, I was also partially shocked. Were you? You didn't expect it to happen. Well, when you look at the Supreme Court makeup of a 5-4 GOP led, and we have seen how this Supreme Court has ruled in other cases that were pretty much against the rights of the people. That's what um, kind of shocked me. But then when I was thinking about, um, well, I was thinking in the broader sense of what was at stake here, I came across with a thought that probably would have explained why one of these GOP justices, I understand it was a five to four. It was. Um, it was Justice Kennedy joined with the four liberals. And, and, and my response is very simple. Justice Kennedy is a libertarian. And that means that he agrees with equal rights under the law, what he doesn't agree with is uh, using the government to help people, which is why he voted against us on Obamacare. Uh, but he does agree with equal rights under the law, and like most libertarians, he supports liberals when it comes to getting the government out of our private lives. He d- supports conservatives when it comes to rejecting government aid to people uh, you know, in a financial way. Uh, Sorry, so that, that's why I think he made the decision. What, what are well, your thoughts? I, I, my thoughts, since you mentioned it was Justice Kennedy, I'm, I thank you for clarifying who it was. I have to say, Justice Kennedy, he's a peculiar character on that Supreme Court because you're just, point, you're just pointing out that he believes of equal rights and, I guess, equal justice under the law, but he is also one of those Supreme Court, Supreme Court justices responsible for putting George W. Bush into the White That's House. That's true. He's also responsible, and this is the real yin-yang of the uh, decisions on Tuesday and Wednesday. He's also responsible for striking down the Voting Rights Act, at least that provision of it that requires the, the more racist jurisdictions of the United States to get preclearance from the Justice Department. That was a 5-4 to four decision, and in that case, all five conservatives voted to declare it unconstitutional the four liberals would uphold the Voting Rights Act. And that, of and course, is protected voting 
for almost 50 years now, since 1965. So uh, to me, I can't be fully happy as long as any of my fellow Americans are suffering. And so while I'm excited that finally, at least in 13 states and D.C., there is full equality for gay couples, I'm extremely disappointed that uh, states like Texas, which two hours after the Supreme Court decision passed a voting restriction law, uh, that uh, they're going to be able to 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 pass restrictive voting. Uh, it, it's it's un-American to not let every American citizen have that right to vote. And add to the list also the Citizens United. Well, of course. Of course. The yep. idea that, that somehow not only are corporations are people, but they can get unlimited donations from anonymous sources and control our political system uh, is <laughs> – an amazing attack on our democracy. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that Justice Kennedy is is, is the best justice since sliced bread. I mean, I, I like, right. I, I got to tell you this. I'm, I'm a huge fan of both the justices appointed by President Obama, Justice Kagan and Justice Sotomayor, and yep. both justices appointed by Bill Clinton, Justice Breyer and Justice Ginsburg. I think all four of them are solid intellectuals who respect the Constitution and also respect human rights. Uh, justice Kennedy, he's the swing justice. So sometimes yep. I praise him and, and sometimes I condemn him. He was right on this account. And what's interesting. Is when it comes to gay rights, Justice Kennedy has been pretty consistent. Uh, he... I think it's much more than that, though. Okay. All right. It's just going to be an interesting theory. But if you recall, at least during the past 10 years, with the Republicans going all over the media airways talking about Christian morals and family values yep. and denouncing gays, lo and behold, what happens? We find several GOPs um, that that are coming out of the closet yep, that are few. gay, that are, have engaged in perhaps prostitution. That's you a know. different issue, but okay. I, yeah, different issue. But the thing is that, you know, the, the Republicans can't be harping much on morals and family values, you know, when they engage in the same practices that they're condemning liberals and Democrats of doing, which pretty much, in essence, like, you know, in the issue of gay um, relationships, there is pretty much nothing wrong legally. Now, uh, I, 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 let, me, let me just say something about that, Michael, because uh, you've actually, it's a nice segue to what I'm going to talk about uh, when, I'm, when I'm through with my conversation with you, which is sort of the history of the gay rights movement, my own personal role in it. Uh, but a lot of it has to do with individuals all across the country. Again, I played a tiny role, but, but hundreds of thousands of people played a tiny role. The more people came out of the closet, the more people said to their family members and their friends and their colleagues at work, uh, yeah, hey, I'm gay. And people are like, oh, you're gay? I, I, didn't, I, I thought all gay people you know, uh, wore uh, t- uh, tight clothes on and, or, or, or uh, dressed in drag at Pride, which of course is a very, very small percentage of the gay community, but the one that got all the air. Once they found out that their ordinary colleagues and their friends and their nephews and so forth were gay, people were like, oh, well, I guess you're human. Why would I want to discriminate against you? One of the most fascinating exactly. polls that I've, that I've seen, and it's been consistent for 20 years, is that people who know gay people, that know lesbian people, that know bisexual or transgender people, if you know someone, if you have a close friend or a relative who's gay, uh, more than 80% uh, today, it used to be more than 80%, today it's more than 90% of people who know gay people support equal rights for gay people. Of course not. No one wants to hurt their friend. But of the people who do not have a relative, a friend uh, in their lives, uh, still the majority, it's not as high as 90%, but still 60, 65% of people who do not have close friends and colleagues who are gay uh, oppose equal rights for gay people. And it's very simple. It, it, if you have friends, if you got family, you don't want them mistreated. And so what? as gay people have come out of the closet, and lesbians and bisexual and transgender people, as they've told who they are, as they've told their story, this is why Don't Ask, Don't Tell was such a terrible thing, because mm-hmm. we should tell, we should be proud of who we are, and the more we tell about who we are, the less likely people are going to discriminate against us. But it, it, goes much, it goes much more than that, Mark. Okay. For one, for one thing, let's, let's go back to the GOP's um, hypocrisy, if I can say that. One notable person, Mary Cheney, the daughter of Dick Cheney. Vice Right, President Vice President. Dick Cheney. Right. Okay. She is one of several GOPs that are... Uh, we call them Republicans. GOP, Grand Old Parties, doesn't, doesn't it? So just well, call them Republicans. All right. Okay. <laughs> I, I say Republicans. Yeah. One of several Republicans that are befitting in this issue of actually being gay. If the Supreme Court were to have um, ruled against gay marriage, that means all those on the gay side would have had to force... Um, quote, comply 
with that particular ruling. Yeah, they'd have to forcibly include, divorce all these people, which is not easy to do. Which would include <laughs> uh, Mary Cheney. Right. Now, the other side of that would be if somewhere down the line you learn that these GOPs, I mean, these Republicans who are gay are suddenly and secretly given special privileges. We would not hear the end of it. So perhaps some of these judges like Kennedy probably thought, oh, gosh, I put Bush into the White House. You know, we work with him on this and that as a miss to the opposition of the American people. I better watch out who my bread and butter is. I'll tell you this. Um, it is very true that family members, including family members of Republicans, are very important in this. When Rob Portman, Senator Rob Portman of Ohio, Republican senator, when his son came out to him, that suddenly may changed Rob Portman's worldview. Now, this is not this is a, a conservative Republican who voted for the Defense of Marriage Act, who voted against gay rights consistently down the line. And suddenly his teenage son says he's gay. And suddenly gay people are not this foreign entity, these strange people who I've never heard of, never known. It's my own son. And my son's normal. And he's a good kid. And I love my son. And wait a minute. Maybe I shouldn't be hating gay people because I'd be passing laws to discriminate against my old son. And, and so that changed his mind, and in doing so, it, it, it's, again, the more people come out. One of the things I'm going to talk about, uh, as soon as we're done, Michael, uh, yeah. is, is the fascinating turn of events. Because I got involved in marriage equality. I'm one of the founders of Marriage Equality California. And I got involved in 1999 because another father, a guy by the name of Pete Knight, who was a California state legislator, Pete Knight did not like that his son was gay. And he was so against his own son being gay that he started legislation that became Proposition 22, also called the Knight Initiative in California, to punish his own child. He made it illegal for every Californian uh, gay couple to get married. And it's because of this father's malice toward his own son that I and many others got involved in the gay rights movement. How ironic that uh, 13, 14 years later, uh, we have another father's love for his son showing support for gay rights. Uh, from, from Pete Knight to Rob Portman, I guess, uh, should be the theme of, of, uh, of, of my show today. Uh, let, me, let me give you one last word, Michael, then I'm, I'm going to move on and tell my story. You can call back in later on the broadcast when we, when we talk about some other things. But, but go okay. ahead. Yeah, well, in summary, I just wanted to point out to everybody that there are a few lessons to be learned from this um, whole um, this whole decision and this whole thing about gay rights. The first thing is that when it comes to gays, just like African Americans, we don't look at the people's skin color. You don't judge them by the the color of their skin. You don't judge them by their sexual orientation. You judge them by their heart, their minds, and their characters. And that's the way it should be. Secondly, um, did I ever explain to you of my theory or lesson of the 10 house neighborhood rule? Uh, no, go right ahead. Okay. You're in the neighborhood on the block. There's 10 houses. Each house has um, is occupied by two people of the same gender. But Two of the two of the ten um, occupants, paired occupants, are actually gay. Yeah, and about one in person, ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're both standing out in front of the um, residence. You know, you have a pair of males, you have a pair of females. Mm-hmm. How would you know which couple is gay and which couple is just roommates splitting the cost of mm-hmm. living? And the answer is, you don't. You don't know, and you're not supposed to know. The whole thing is just like since I'm a married man, I don't want anyone interfering or prying into my personal relationship and intimate relationship with my wife. Who am I or anybody to pry into the personal relationship or whatever goes on behind closed doors of somebody else as long as there is no crime going on? You know, I I, I could say it all in four words, and I'm going to quote the great Justice Brandeis who wrote this 100 years Mm -hmm. ago. It's very simple. Live and let live. It's there that you simple. If I'm, so you if you're not, if life. someone isn't harming anybody else, leave, leave us alone. Leave us yeah, alone. Let no me do what I want to do as long as I'm not harming you. Uh, people, you know, I used to see if you can throw your fists wherever you want as long as they don't get near my face. You know, you <laughs> if you want to do funky dancing, I'm, I may laugh at it, but uh, I'm never going to prohibit it. I'm never going to, you know, unless, you, unless you, you throw your fists so close that they hit my face. Thank you for your call, Michael. I appreciate it. When we come back, I want to give, again, the history. We, we talked about Hawaii, the history from 1993 to today, and also tell you about my own personal role. 
because I had a small part to play in this history, uh, one that I'm very proud of, and one that I recognize is similar to that of tens of thousands of people nationwide. Uh, this didn't just happen. These events don't happen in a vacuum. Society has changed its opinion in the United States and worldwide, and largely due to individuals coming out and making their voices heard. This is We Act Radio. It's all about activism. It's all about the power of individual voices. And in the gay rights movement, there's no question that individual voices finally, finally, finally change the character of laws in America. If you want to call in, it's 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk. Check out my website at MarkLevineTalk.com. And we'll be right back right after this. WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Take Action News with David Schuster, Saturdays from 12 to 3 on We Act Radio, 1480 AM, and weactradio.com. Well, for me, it's always been, you know, you report the facts. You report like hell, let the chips fall where they may. And the truth, ultimately, the truth ultimately is what's going to sort of help our society and help all of us. I don't think progressives want a thumb on the scale on the facts. They just want the facts out there. You let the facts out and progressives will tell you, you know, we're going to win 70% of the time. Uh, you may quibble with the, the percentages or whatnot, but I think that's just sort of what progressives are looking for. And I think that's where this all sort of meshes with, with my interest as a journalist. And my interest, interest as a journalist is... Report the facts. Here's what's going on. Here's what the facts say. Here's what history says. Here are the lessons we know we have learned. And let people draw their own conclusions. And I think what's so unfortunate right now in the world of broadcast media is I do think that a lot of conservative radio, certainly conservative television, they're not interested in facts. And that's ultimately where I think conservative media is going to have its downfalls, that Americans are hungry. They're just hungry for basic information, hungry for basic facts. You report like hell. You let the chips fall where they may. I think it's it's natural for all of us who care, who are passionate about politics, who feel like we have a sense about the difference between right and wrong. I think it's okay to let that be part of your cover. It's important for all of us as broadcasters and journalists. In this day and age, we have to be authentic. You can't be the person who's up in the ivory tower that comes down and tells people, now you must eat your peas. No, it's all about, we all have personalities, and I think it's being aware sometimes of our own bias, but also being open to the idea that sometimes we're wrong, but we have a dialogue, and we have a passionate dialogue, and we care about this country, we care about this community, and I think that sort of passion is what carries us through. Hear more from David Schuster, Saturdays from 12 to 3 on Take Action News on WE Act Radio. 
1480 AM and WeActRadio.com. You're listening to WPWC, We Act Radio, 1480 AM, WeActRadio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking about the Supreme Court decision that occurred just last Wednesday. Surprised a lot of people. I did not think it would happen. Um, I predicted it. And I, uh, the reason that I think is because I had an idea of how far we've come, and it doesn't surprise me that uh, this event happened. So I, I want to talk about how far we've come. And... When I last left off, I was talking about the Hawaii decision. The Hawaii decision in 1993, Bear v. Lewin, shocked a lot of people who never conceived of the fact that gay people would even want to get married. Um, gay people had slowly come into the national consciousness, uh, sometimes kicking and screaming. Perhaps the most famous gay person who did not want to be outed was Rock Hudson. But of course, with the AIDS epidemic and this... Uh, very masculine, strapping actor, Rock Hudson, known for his leading male roles. And it comes out that he's gay, and he only comes out because he has AIDS and he's dying. And Americans got to see, oh, wow, um, Rock Hudson doesn't fit our stereotype of what a gay man is like. And I remember in 1994, just a little bit after the Hawaii decision, I was living in California. And I worked with a bunch of activists, and I certainly did not do this alone. And we did a march on Hollywood. Long before we had marches in states for equal rights under the law, we took on Hollywood. Because Hollywood, let's face it, is fairly liberal. Hollywood is fairly open. And Hollywood did not have any positive portrayals of gay people until the 1990s. But the only portrayal I can recall prior to the 1990s of gay people was uh, Billy Crystal played a character on Soap, uh, a short-lived um, show in the, when was that, the 80s, where he played a very stereotypical, mincing gay person uh, for laughs. And that's often how gay people were played, for laughs. I, I, ironically, when you look at how African Americans were portrayed 60, 70 years earlier, they were also played for laughs. Amos and Andy, the, the minstrel show. It's not easier to mistreat someone if you if you laugh at them, uh, in fact, um, the uh, Ralph Ellison writes about this in Invisible Man, a wonderful novel in the 1950s about how black people were invisible in America, about how you might have a black waiter uh, pouring your coffee or a black maid taking care of your child, and they were invisible to you. Uh, white people would have these very secretive, important discussions as if the black person didn't exist. Uh, kind of like how you might get undressed in front of your dog. You know, we don't mind being naked in front of our dog because the dog doesn't notice our nakedness. They're not people. Well, blacks were often treated not as people by white people, and they would talk about the most uh, intimate things uh, because it was almost assumed that the black person wasn't human and wasn't thinking and wouldn't have opinions on all of these things. Um, and so the... I think it was uh, Mahatma Gandhi in India. Not Mahatma Gandhi, excuse me. Um, yeah, Mahatma Gandhi, who said, uh, first you ignore us, and then you mock us, then you fight us, and then we win. And that has been the tradition of civil rights for every people. For African Americans, they were ignored, uh, mistreated, obviously slavery, and then, then ignored then mocked, again, I think of Amos and Andy in minstrel shows, and then fought against the great civil rights movement of the 1960s, and then winning. Now, I'm not claiming that there's complete victory. We talked about the Voting Rights Act. But the same principle happened with gay people. First ignored, then mocked, then fought against, and then we win. So in the early 1990s, I was part of a march on Hollywood. And I remember talking to some Hollywood executives, person to person. I give them credit for being willing to talk to us. And I remember, I can see to this day, this pained expression by a fairly high-level Hollywood executive. 
Uh, and we appealed to him and said, look, you know this is wrong. He was not prejudiced. He did not support prejudice against gay people. Why aren't gay people in American culture? Why not? I mean, there was a time when you, you didn't see blacks in American culture, right? I mean, think back to Leave it to Beaver. Is there a single black person in Leave it to Beaver in the 1950s? I don't think so. And then in the 60s and the 70s with shows like All in the Family and later The Jeffersons and uh, What's Happening and all, you had black families. And later, of course, culminating in the, the Cosby show, positively portrayed black families because there are positive black families out there. They were just being ignored and then mocked and then fought against. And then we went. So we said the same should happen with gay people, gay men, lesbians, with showing America the reality of gay people's lives. The first one I can remember was the real world. Now, someone can call in if they can remember something earlier, but the first time they showed a positive portrayal of a gay person was on MTV, I guess the forefront of American culture, right? This is the youth music video network. And what was his name? Um... Was it Pascal? I don't remember his name. But in the early 1990s, in the real world, they showed the real world, the reality of a gay man. And, well, the country didn't collapse. And young people said, yeah, he's cool. We're all cool. <laughs> live and let live. And then came my, my protest. Uh, I believe, I'm pretty sure it was 1994. And I still remember, as I said, the pain expression of this executive who looked me straight in the eyes. And he said, Mark... I agree that gay people exist. I agree that the reality should be shown to the American people. But I don't think the American people are ready for that yet. I think there'd be too much complaints. I think there'd be too much pushback. I think people wouldn't, wouldn't like it. And I said to him, you don't know unless you try. And I predict that the first time you put a gay person right up there, up front, not as some side character, not as some stock character, not as friend number three, but right there in a leading role. Openly gay, proud to be gay with all the risks and foibles and fun of any ordinary person. America will flock to that show and your network will make a lot of money. And he said, maybe you're right, I don't know. I'll tell you this though. About two years after that conversation, and again, I'm not saying I'm the only one that did this. We all did this. There were hundreds of us that talked with Hollywood executives that day. But pretty soon after, out came the show Will and Grace, the wonderful friendship between a gay man and a straight woman that warmed our hearts. And Will and Grace pretty quickly rose to be the top-ranked national show in America. Not only did America not want to hear about gay people's lives, they wanted to watch. They thought it was fun. And, of course, the, the, the brilliance of the show was there were two primary gay characters and a bunch of straight characters, too. But one gay character fit the stereotype, and that was part of the fun because some gay people fit the stereotype. That was Jack, and he was way out there uh, as a f proud, flaming gay man. And then there was Will, more conservative, as it were, small c, a lawyer, uh, someone who was respectable, someone who was uh, more mainstream. And the, the difficulties between Will and Jack, and of course between him and Grace, who had her own problems as a straight woman, uh, and uh, you know the, the incredible character of Karen, who was probably the most extreme of all the four characters, even though she was uh, straight, she <laughs> had her own issues, God knows, with money and everything. What a great show. And the amazing thing about Will and Grace is it wasn't just good comedy, it wasn't just a good moneymaker for the networks, obviously a top-ranked show. But Will and Grace changed people's minds. The power of Hollywood. Vice President Biden, when he talked about why he supported marriage equality, a few days before President Obama came out and supported marriage equality, Biden kind of pushed, uh, pushed it a bit, and good for Joe Biden for doing that. I've always been proud of him for that. He said that shows like Will and Grace changed his mind. How can you not love human beings who are just like any other human beings except they, they may love a different kind of person, right? 
men who love men, women who love women, right? We all have friends. Some like blondes, some like brunettes, some like people of different races, some like tall, short, fat, thin. Whoever we love should not determine how we are judged. And Will and Grace, as I said, later became the reason why Joe Biden and later Barack Obama came out in support of marriage equality. So that was a big deal. And I'm proud, proud to have played a small role in it. Meanwhile, though, because of the Hawaii decision, states across America started passing anti-gay laws. And throughout the mid-90s, this was a big thing that brought the Republican Party together. Today, we have the Tea Party. Well, in those days, it was largely a tax on gay people that brought Republicans together. It was considered a way for them to win votes. In fact, I think one of the reasons why Bill Clinton signed the Defense of Marriage Act, and I think he would admit this today, not because he hates gay people. Bill Clinton, I think, has always believed in equality for all, but he felt that it was politically required. It's politically necessary. Frankly, I think it's the same reason why Barack Obama used to be opposed to marriage equality. The politics of it. The majority of Americans didn't support it. And if you want to run for president of the United States, it's very hard to be out in front of the public. I mean, think about John F. Kennedy and African-American rights, or Franklin Roosevelt, for that matter. Do you think the two of them were actively racist? No, but they didn't go as far as they could have because of the prevailing sentiment of the time. That's what politicians do. And I'm not justifying that. I'm simply recognizing the reality of what was. In fact, people forget the Defense of Marriage Act was paired with the Employment Non-Discrimination Act, which almost passed. They paired them the same day. They said that they, would, they could do a vote on ENDA if they could do a vote on DOMA. They could do a vote to end discrimination against gay people in the workplace if they could also do a vote on prohibiting federal recognition of marriages by gay couples that were allowed by the states. Uh, ENDA failed by one vote. It was 50 to 49. Al Gore was ready to cast the deciding vote. Unfortunately, one senator did not show up, and the vote lost. And to this day, in many states across the United States, you can fire someone just because they're gay. So the mid-1990s were perhaps the low point in gay rights. And many people thought, well, it's just not going to happen. Uh, the American people aren't ready for something as radical as giving gay couples the same rights as straight couples. I was a lawyer in California. I um, was practicing. I was helping the Democratic Party. Um, I was very disappointed in Bill Clinton's decision on Defense of Marriage Act, although I did understand it. But I can't say I was really that much of a gay activist, except for the March on Hollywood that I talked about. Interestingly, it was a parent's malice toward his own son, a California legislator by the name of Pete Knight, who had a disagreement with his own son, who didn't like that his son was gay, who was embarrassed the way a parent should never be, that his son was gay. Here his son had taken the very brave act of coming out in such a hostile environment. And instead of praising his son's courage, Pete Knight couldn't handle it. And his own emotional immaturity caused him to do an attack on all gay families throughout California. But the bitter irony is that his attack on gay families led to, well, led to an involvement in marriage defense and marriage equality led to my personal involvement. And that attack actually led to an outbreak of activists nationwide supporting marriage equality. Sometimes you don't know how much you miss a freedom until your freedom is attacked even more. And I think Pete Knight made a terrible mistake if he had just talked to his son and dealt with the matter rather than attacking all of us, I might not have never have gotten so involved in the gay rights movement. And I'll tell you my story and how I responded to the Knight Initiative when we come back. If you want to call in, it's 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop, and we'll be right back right after this. <laughs> You're 
listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Friends, David Schuster here, and all of us at We Act Radio are so proud of our neighbors here in Southeast D.C., especially one of our partners, The Ark. The Ark is at 1901 Mississippi Avenue Southeast. It's the home to some of Washington's best, including the Washington Ballet, the Levine School of Music, Boys and Girls Club, and the Children's Health Project all provide a number of programs and services within the very same facility. The Ark is also home to the Ark Theater, the only theater east of the river, which hosts a variety of dance, music, and theatrical shows each year. Almost everything you could want is at the Ark, so stop by and see them. The Ark, 1901 Mississippi Avenue in Southeast. For more information, visit the Ark's website, www.thearkdc.org, or call 202-889-5901. The Ark, part of Southeast D.C. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine, talking about the gay rights movement and, frankly, my own personal involvement in it, uh, how it is that I uh, got involved. Uh, so it's I'm a lawyer in California, and uh, we talked about how Hawaii, the Hawaii Supreme Court passed this very far-reaching decision. Uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, the people of Hawaii, who are generally liberal people, but back in 93, 94, that was considered pretty radical— and the people of Hawaii voted for a constitutional amendment overturning the Hawaii Supreme Court decision, uh, and therefore marriage was still not legal in Hawaii. Fast forward to 1998, and the focus was on Vermont. The Vermont court, like the Hawaii court, said, hey, Ho Vermont's constitution allows equality under the law, and you can't discriminate on the basis of gender. Uh, and of course, uh, Marriage equality discrimination, marriage discrimination is largely discrimination on the basis of gender, right? You're saying that a man can marry a woman, but a woman can't marry a woman just because she's a woman. That's sex discrimination. So Vermont said this is a discrimination on the basis of sex and sexual orientation, and we have to allow equality under the law. And so the, the Vermont legislature was given two choices. They can support either marriages or civil unions, which the... Vermont legislature was told is the equivalent of marriage. Of course, marriage was considered too radical, too far-reaching, so they supported civil unions. But civil unions were not equivalent to marriage. And one of the reasons they weren't equivalent to marriage is because they didn't have the full rights under federal law. In fact, even if Vermont had married gay couples, they wouldn't have full rights under federal law because of the Defense of Marriage Act, because in 1996, the federal government, uh, Congress, passed a law and they said they were doing it to express moral disapproval of homosexuals. They did it because they actively wanted to discriminate. This was in the Supreme Court decision cited. And they said that the federal government would not recognize uh, gay uh, couples' marriages. But Vermont did civil reunions, and now it's 1998, and I'm living in California in 1999. I hear about Pete Knight, California legislator who managed to get signatures on a ballot proposition that would ban gay couples' marriages in California and also ban recognition of out-of-state marriages. Now, first of all, you have to understand how California works. So California and about 12 other states, mostly Western states, though I know it's true in Maine as well, allow for direct democracy, allow for the citizens of that state to vote on uh, issues of law. 
And in California, Pete Knight uh, didn't think he could get this through a Democratic legislature. So he decided to go directly to the people of California and ask them to ban gay couples from getting married. The irony is that same-sex marriage was already prohibited in California. Way back in the 1970s, California had said marriage is between a man and a woman. So what was Pete Knight up to? Why would he ban something that had already been banned? Well, the real thing he was doing was not stopping same-sex couples from marrying in California. That was already banned. What he was really doing was trying to prevent California from recognizing marriages performed out of state. Hawaii had tried, uh, didn't succeed, but almost succeeded in getting uh, the rights of gay couples to marry. Then Vermont, their Supreme Court, uh, held that uh, gay couples have equal rights under the law. Out came civil unions and not marriage. But uh, Pete Knight could see the writing on the wall, and he could see that one state was eventually going to allow gay couples to marry, and when that happened, he wanted California to be ready to deny that. Why? Well, I don't know personally the specifics of his relationship with his son, but I do know Pete Knight's son is gay, and I do know that Pete Knight's son bravely came out, and I do know that Pete Knight had trouble with it, and I do know that Pete Knight decided that he didn't want his son marrying the person of his choice. Now, most fathers that don't like when their children marry someone they don't want to marry, they tell their kid, I don't like this person you want to marry. Maybe in the worst case scenario, they cut them off from the family fortune. But it's extremely few fathers that say, I'm going to prohibit you and tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Californians uh, from getting married as well. But this extraordinary malice, this extraordinary bigotry, this extraordinary hate between parent and child led to Pete Knight getting on the ballot a proposition. He called it the, we called it the Knight Initiative. It was later called Proposition 22 that went on the ballot in 2000 to have Californians ban marriage again in the state and also ban recognition of gay couples' marriages performed out of state. And... I found this story so extreme, so obnoxious, so horrific, this hatred, malice, whatever you want to call it, between father and son, that I got involved in a fight against the Knight Initiative. And I remember, because there were very few of us at that time, we were meeting in Los Angeles, which of course is California's largest city, and there were, what, 10 of us? 12 of us involved in this fight? Not that many. We were early on the People Against the Night Initiative. And we actually had a big argument amongst us. There are about 12 of us, and as I recall it, uh, the argument was this. We argued, I argued, about five of the 12 of us argued, that it was very important to show Californians the reality of gay people's lives. We thought that Will and Grace was a success precisely because of it. We needed to show Californians gay couples, show them lesbian couples, show them gay families, show them the children that are being raised by gay couples and lesbian couples, show them happy families, and appeal to their humanity and say, hey, we're human beings. We deserve equal rights under the law. Vote down the Knight Initiative. Vote down Proposition 22. Seven of the group the majority of the group, the bare majority of the group, disagree with us. They said, look, it's already illegal in California for gay couples to marry. So the Knight Initiative is largely redundant. It seeks to prohibit that which is already prohibited. We should urge Californians to vote no on Proposition 22 because it's unnecessary. Gay couples already can't marry. So... Vote no. Whether or not you support gay couples' right to marry, vote no. It's unnecessary, and it unnecessary demeans gay people who already aren't allowed to marry. We, the five of us on the anti-Night Committee, thought that was crazy. That was ridiculous. It was true that California didn't need two prohibitions against gay couples marrying. But we didn't think there was any passion or emotion and people going to polls, vote against an unnecessary redundant bill. Mm. 
Can you see a march in the streets? Unnecessary redundancies are wrong. Somehow I can't imagine massive passion against unnecessary redundancies. We wanted to show people's lives. We wanted to show people's lives. And the polls show we were going to lose. We were going to lose 60-40. And we said, you know what? We may well lose this fight. We'll probably lose this fight. But even if we lose this fight, we'll win in the future. Because we'll show real people. We'll show real lives. We'll come out and we'll show who gay people are. And even if we lose this battle, we can win the next one. We'll set fertile ground. We'll set the seeds in the ground for the next fight. Sad to say, I lost that rhetorical battle. And the anti-Prop 22 campaign, the majority voted not to show gay people's lives, but to vote against this redundant bill. And that's what all the commercials said. And we didn't just lose 60-30. We lost like 62-38. We lost massively. And those of us that disagreed, like myself, resigned from the Anti-Night Initiative Committee because we didn't agree with the way the battle was being fought. But I did meet some allies in the fight for marriage equality. I was angry that the gay community was so tepid, so timid, so afraid of showing the reality of gay people's lives, so scared to show a real-life gay couple with their real-life children living ordinary lives that they wouldn't even put it in the campaign against this night initiative, this Proposition 22. But three other people I met in there agreed with me. They said we shouldn't be afraid of showing the reality and of openly supporting marriage equality. <gasps> oh, my God. Not just opposing a second initiative to ban gay couples from getting married and to ban recognition of same-sex marriages, but to actively support to the law. It was a radical idea. But four of us, L.J. Carasoni, a, a gay man like myself, uh, Bruce, who was a straight guy, young guy who didn't said that I, he wasn't going to marry his girlfriend as long as gay couples were not also allowed to get married. And Lisa Lavote, uh, she's a lesbian woman. The four of us, all young people, in 1999, we got together and we formed Marriage Equality California. We had some uh, you know, discussion about the name. We called it Mecca. You know, Mecca is, of course, where the Muslims pray in Saudi Arabia. We were afraid of being confused. M-E-C-A, Marriage Equality California. And we decided we weren't just going to oppose a redundant bill to prohibit gay people from getting married. We were going to actively support marriage equality. That we were citizens of the United States. We had the right to equal rights under the law. And so this motley crew of young activists, uh, we got together. And it wasn't my idea. I can't remember whose idea it was. I, I don't take credit for it. LJ, Bruce, Lisa, whose idea was it to start Valentine's Day protests? I don't remember which of the four of us. It wasn't me. Decided that on Valentine's Day, February 14th, a day that celebrates love, we were going to go to the Beverly Hills Courthouse in Southern California and try to get a whole bunch of same-sex couples married. And I'm proud to say we were the first Valentine's Day protest, at least that I'm aware of, in the country. And in 2000, before people actually voted on Proposition 22, we got out there and we had the val first Valentine's Day protest. As the only lawyer in the group, I was sent to talk with the police and City Hall before the event. Uh, the police actually feared violence. But I'll tell you about the first Valentine's Day protest when we come back. I was very, very proud to be a part of those early activist events. And then later on in the broadcast, I'm going to tell you another story that may surprise you even more. How gay rights organizations back in 2000, just 13 years ago, were so afraid of public backlash that even they worked to harm marriage equality. It's amazing how far we've come. Don't miss the rest of the story. Coming up right after this break. If you want to call in, it's 
202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. You can follow me on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk. Go to my website at MarkLevineTalk.com. We'll be right back with the rest of the story right after this. Listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, WeActRadio.com. Hello, my name is Jim Gray, and I am a judge of the Superior Court in California and a former federal prosecutor in Los Angeles. I would like to talk to you for a moment about marijuana. Did you know that since the federal government first banned marijuana in 1937, usage in this country has actually gone up by about 4,000 percent? Or did you know that in the Netherlands, where adults are allowed to possess small amounts of marijuana and buy it from government-regulated businesses, fewer adults and fewer teenagers smoke marijuana than here in our country? Or that an American is arrested on marijuana charges every 38 seconds? If you are wondering if any of this makes sense, you are not alone. To find out more, contact the Marijuana Policy Project at 1-877-JOIN-MPP or visit them on the web at mpp.org. Thank you and good luck to us all. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine talking about not just uh, what happened in the United States Supreme Court last Wednesday, but how we got there and my own small role in it. By the way, I've written an article in the Huffington Post on this. Uh, if you want, uh, just Google Huffington Post, Mark Levine, and Vindication, and you should find it, uh, talking about exactly what I'm talking here today. So uh, four of us, young people, ragtag, wide-eyed idealists, got together Two gay guys, a straight guy, and a lesbian woman. And uh, we formed Marriage Equality California. We lined up in front of the courthouse in Beverly Hills and all tried to get married. I was the only lawyer in the group. So I was liaison with the police and uh, with City Hall. And I contacted the police and I assured them there would be no violence because that's the thing they were most concerned of. And, and I'm fine with that. They should be concerned. I told them we're very, very peaceful. Um, we got about 40, 50 people together, but it was going to be a peaceful protest. And I went in and I told the clerks, this is what's going to happen. We're going to line up two by two and gay couples are going to try to get married. And the clerk said, we have to deny their marriages. We don't want people getting upset, tearing down the place. We're like, no, don't worry. We're peaceful American citizens. We disagree with the law, but we're not violent. We're not going to do anything but protest it. All we want from you is... You know, you can have a big stamp that says denied. And that looked good for the cameras. They said, well, we can't do that, but we can, you know, uh, we can give you this little piece of paper that we attach that says denied, fine, you know. Um, and, in fact, they were very nice to me because there is a licensing fee for the marriage license. And they agreed that since they were going to deny our applications that uh, they were just going to waive the fee because they weren't going to accept them anyway. And I thought that was actually very nice of them. So... Just in case the marriages went through, we started lining up long-term gay couples. Couples have been together 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Couples that really wanted to get married. And they lined up, and they were all there, and they were all denied. And then, well, we had a little fun with it. Uh, I went in. I, I, I tried to marry LJ, my fellow uh, gay uh, marriage equality activist. I think I tried to marry him twice that day. Uh, people started trying to marry each other. We went in and, I don't know, 50, 100, 200 times saying such couples were denied marriage equality. Now, some would say this was meaningless theater. I mean, we didn't sue based on this. It's true. 
that would occur later on in the famous David Boys and uh, Ted Olson case. Those are the two lawyers that opposed each other in Bush v. Gore, but took the fight for gay equality all the way to the Supreme Court and won on Wednesday. But we knew it was too early for that. We just wanted to get some publicity. And we knew that if we did it on Valentine's Day and we invited the press, and the press came out, and lo and behold, here are all these nice-looking gay couples, all ages. None of us had extreme clothing or <laughs> any of the things you might see in a parade or, frankly, at a football game where, you know, you know the guys that have their shirts off and paint themselves different colors. None of that. We're just ordinary citizens trying to get equal rights under the law. So I just remember that day, Beverly Hills. It was a beautiful Southern California day like they all are, maybe the kinds that you don't appreciate until you live back in the East Coast again. And I remember how happy everyone was that day. That may surprise you. I mean, here are gay couples that have been together for decades. And they want to get married. And their right to have their marriage recognized by the state, not only to have the thousand or so privileges that state law gives, confers to gay couples, those were being denied, but also simple recognition that they had equal rights under the law was being denied. And yet there wasn't a tear, there wasn't sadness, everyone was joyful, it was happy. Because we recognized, I think to a person, we recognized that this was the beginning. That one day this would become a reality. That at the time, people couldn't even conceive of gay couples marrying. And I think we all knew within some period of time, in this case it was less than 15 years, it not only is a reality, it's such a reality that today young people can't conceive of why it would ever be illegal to prevent a couple of adults who love each other and want to form a family from doing just that. So we were happy. And I still remember all the faces of all the people, many of whom I've never seen again, talk about how powerful it was to go to the courthouse to sign up for a marriage license, even if it was denied, expressing that wish to be treated equally under the law, doing so peacefully. I'm too young to have been involved in the great marches for civil rights, but this was something I could do. And it was something that just four of us thought of. We didn't ask permission. We didn't go to the Democratic Party and say, is this okay? We didn't go to California officials. We didn't even talk to the anti-Night Initiative, who was so busy focusing on Let's stop unnecessary redundancies redundancies, rather than let's protect gay people's lives. Gay rights groups weren't with us. Not at first. Just four people. Two gay men, a straight guy, and a lesbian woman. We got 50 people together. We tried to get married and we failed. But we began a tradition. And the Valentine's Day protests started to go all across the nation. I know they had them in New York. They had them in other areas of California. And soon, gay couples all across America were trying to get married on February 14th. Wow. And we got involved just because Pete Knight didn't like his sons being gay and tried to harm all of us. So we lost, eventually, Proposition 22 that same year, 2000. We lost that fight. But we were doing it our way. Not the way of saying this is unnecessary law, California already discriminates against gay people. We don't need more discrimination. It's redundant. But saying, hey, we're here. We exist. We're good people. We're ordinary families. We're just like you. We just happen to be gay or lesbian or bisexual. We live. We love. Give us the same rights that you have. I remember also arguing against Proposition 22, the Night Initiative. I remember going to a church in Simi Valley, California. For those of you who don't know California geography, Simi Valley is where the cops were from that beat up Rodney King, the white cops. It's a suburban neighborhood. It's very white. It's very conservative. And I went to a church there. So imagine a church in a conservative white area of Southern California. 
and I argued vociferously in a debate for marriage equality. And some people in the panel argued again, as I said, well, this is unnecessary, it's redundant. I didn't. I made a full-throated call for marriage equality. It's actually one of my first public speaking long before I came to Washington. I still have that video somewhere, that grainy video. But I remember saying at the time how surprised I was by the arguments against marriage equality. I put them on the defensive rather than we saying we don't need this unnecessary law and people mocking us like, you know, because no one's going to fight for laws being necessary or unnecessary. I, I put the people opposed to gay equality on the defensive. I remember in the, there's a little booklet whenever you vote on a proposition in California, and there are arguments for and against. And one of the arguments by the proponents was from some 19-year-old girl. That was before young people became solidly supportive of marriage equality. And she said, you know, it's so hard to find the right guy. It's so hard to find nice guys out there, and I want to marry some nice guy. And if gay people are allowed to get married, it makes me that much less likely to find the nice guy I want to marry. And I remember mocking her. I remember saying to this church in Simi Valley, this girl must think every single boy is gay. They must all be gay because if gay people are allowed to get married, she won't get a husband. And everybody laughed. And though I didn't take a count by hands, I could feel the sentiment in the room shift. And I truly believe that two-thirds of the people who walked in that room were opposed to marriage equality. And two-thirds of the people who left that room supported marriage equality. One-third remained supportive all along. One-third were against us all along. But one-third changed their views that day. And I became even more of the belief that coming out of the closet showing people the reality of gay people's lives, showing people and appealing to their basic humanity can cause minds to shift, can cause minds to change. So we lost that battle, 68 to 32, excuse me, 62 to 38, I believe it was, percent, and gay people were despondent, and I argued again that the anti-night initiative went about it the wrong way. We have to show gay people's lives. So learning what I could do is just one of four activists, Marriage Equality California, get on the news and talk about gay rights. I decided, and learning what I did with Hollywood, talking directly to Hollywood execs, I decided, heck, I'm just going to write a law. I'm a lawyer. I'm a California lawyer. And I worked with a fellow gay California lawyer by the name of Jim Toledano, and the two of us together crafted the first civil unions bill in the country after Vermont. And we decided we're not going to call it marriage. People are afraid of the word marriage back in 2000. We didn't think we could get full marriage equality. But we're going to give them full equality. We just won't call it marriage. We'll call it civil unions. And the way I wrote the bill, I even made clear that civil unions would be treated as marriages under federal law. So that uh, it would be not just state rights, but federal rights as well. Jim and I wrote the bill. It was a very simple bill. Uh, some gay activists had talked about making a complicated bill that defined all the thousand rights of marriages and including them all for gay people. And um, uh, Most didn't think that was even possible. We did something very simple. We simply took the California Code, went through it. Every time it talked about marriages, we said marriage or civil union. Marriage or civil union. And we defined a civil union as any two consenting adults not related by blood, who wanted to form a civil union. Straights, gays, didn't matter. And then we worked to elect a California legislator who would support the bill. I actively worked to support Paul Koretz, K-O-R-E-T-Z. He was a straight guy who represented West Hollywood, a gay suburb of Los Angeles. West Hollywood, by the way, is, uh, I think, the first city in the United States to be formed 
that uh, celebrated uh, both Yom Kippur as a, uh, a, a, a city holiday and also um, uh, recognized National AIDS Day. The city was and is today about uh, 30 to 40 percent gay, about 30 to 40 percent Jewish. There is some overlap for gay Jews like myself. But a very liberal city, a city, in fact, designed to carved out of Hollywood to protect gay rights because so many gay people live there. Paul Koretz, great guy, happened to be heterosexual, but he represented uh, West Hollywood. And I helped him get elected. I helped him get elected in the Democratic primary. I helped him get elected to the state legislature. And I did so with an express quid pro quo. All right. I said, if I help you get elected, will you propose as your first piece of legislation a full equality California civil unions bill, a bill that gives gay couples, lesbian couples, all the rights of marriage without the name marriage. He said, I'll, Mark, you get me elected and I'll do it. So I helped him in the uh, primary, helped him in the campaign. Paul Koretz became state, our state representative. And to his credit, when Jim Toledano and I drafted the first civil unions bill, in California, the second in the nation. And we were full equality. Every one of those thousand rights was included. We didn't have to enumerate them. We just said gay people are treated the same under the law as straight people. Gay couples the same as straight couples. Paul Koretz introduced that bill in the California legislature. Now, Jim and I did not think the bill would become law. We understood that we were asking for full equality when we probably were going to have to water it down at some point and accept half a loaf. Uh, maybe they'd push back against raising kids. Maybe they push back against hospital visitation. Maybe they push back against the idea that gay couples shouldn't have to pay any more taxes than straight couples. We didn't know where they pushed back, but we said, we're not starting with zero and asking for one, two, three rights. We're starting with all the rights. And then if in order to get one legislator to pass the bill, in order to get a majority, we understand half a loaf is better than none. Jim and I were very realistic. We know how civil rights works. And if you can get partial civil rights, that's better than none. Full is the best. Partial is better than none. What happened next may shock you. What happened next is that gay rights organizations, specifically the Lambda Legal Defense Fund, the premier legal gay rights organization in the country, demanded that we withdraw our bill, which gave full equal rights to every gay citizen in California, and instead get six rights. Six out of a thousand. Instead of 100%, it would be 0.6%. Why would the premier gay rights organization in the country be opposed to full gay equality? I'll tell you the rest of the story when we come back. You want to call in, it's 202-889-9797, 202-889-9797. This is the Inside Scoop with Mark Levine. Follow us on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk or on the website at MarkLevineTalk.com. Interesting story, and I was there. And I'll tell you why gay rights organizations didn't support gay rights when we come back right after this. listening to WPWC We Act Radio 1480 AM weactradio.com My name is Joe Thompson. I'm 29 years old and I have a career that I love as a systems analyst. Career. It still sounds cool to say that word. I never could have gotten on this path without a college degree. And if the college me were here, he'd tell you. I never would have gotten to college without Big Brothers Big Sisters. I could have ended up anywhere on the streets even. But college? Joe Thompson? Not likely. My big brother helped me out. He taught me I could do anything at a time when a lot of people were saying just the opposite. And to a seven-year-old, that means a lot. My big brother's name is Phil. And Phil is the reason that this seven-year-old grows up to be a systems analyst. Whether you donate money or time, you're helping big brothers, big sisters help a child. 
and that can last a lifetime. Start something today at BigBrothersBigSisters.org. Brought to you by Big Brothers Big Sisters and the Ad Council. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, WeActRadio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. This is Mark Levine giving uh, some of my own personal history with the gay rights movement. I think it's important for people to see what went on behind the scenes. And what happened behind the scenes in 2000 in California may shock you. I just described how a fellow gay lawyer and myself, Jim Toledano, and I drafted a bill that we thought was as far-reaching as we could get. It wasn't even marriage. It was civil unions. But even though it had the name civil unions, it gave Californians full equality under the law at the state and the federal level to the extent that the California legislature could confer, it was full equality under the law. And we helped elect the legislature, Paul Koretz. I helped elect him in uh, uh, West Hollywood. And this new California assemblyman, the first bill he put in, bingo, unchanged, the bill that Jim and I had drafted. Full equality civil unions in California. Actually, broader than the Vermont bill. At that time, the only state in the United States that had civil unions was Vermont. But Vermont didn't include federal rights. Vermont only gave the rights to, at the state level, to Vermont citizens. And we decided to confer federal rights. Now, we knew that it conflicted with the Defense of Marriage Act. But we thought the Defense of Marriage Act was unconstitutional. And so... We uh, felt like, well, great, this will give us the chance to challenge the Defense of Marriage Act because we don't think the federal government has any right in the Constitution. There's nothing about marriage here in the Constitution. And therefore, the federal government cannot say, California, you're required to discriminate when California doesn't want to. So we were ready to take that battle to the United States Supreme Court. A side note on that, by the way, uh, when the Defense of Marriage Act came out, I had a disagreement with a cousin of mine who's also a lawyer, very smart guy, and he agreed with me because we both read the Constitution that there's nothing in the Constitution that allows the federal government to discriminate against uh, uh, gay couples who are married because the federal government doesn't decide who's married and who's not. And I said that... Uh, so so my, my cousin, Stephen, said that because... Justice Scalia is supposed to be a strict constructionist who cares about the, the detailed words of the Constitution. He felt that Justice Scalia would find the obvious point that the Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional. And I thought my cousin was giving Scalia too much credit. I thought that uh, Justice Scalia, that his homophobia and his hatred of gay people would overwhelm his supposed belief in the strict construction of the Constitution. And, uh, hey, Stephen, I won the bet. I don't remember what we bet, but I won the bet because Scalia did not vote for the Constitution. He voted against gay people just Wednesday. But anyway, back to the California. So we passed this. We got the civil unions bill. It gave full equality, not just at the state level, but the federal level, too. And that way it was better than Vermont. We got this pro uh, gay rights legislator, uh, Paul Koretz, to put this in. And we had no illusions that it would become law. We thought it might. We thought it might just become law. We tried to work to make it become law. But if we had to compromise, if we had to say, all right, no rights of adoption, or whatever it was, uh, in order to get half a loaf, we were willing to do that. So I was shocked when I got a phone call a few days after he introduced the bill from Paul Koretz the California assemblyman that I had helped elect. And Paul Koretz called me up and he said, Mark, I've got to withdraw the bill. I said, what are you talking about? Paul, we had a deal. We had a deal. I worked very hard to get you elected. 
I know you support full equality under the law for gay people. Why would you withdraw the first bill in the country to give full equality to gay people in marriages? He said, because Lambda asked me to withdraw it. Lambda, the Gay Legal Defense Fund, the premier gay legal institution. The uh, Lambda is to gay rights what the NAACP is to African Americans, uh, the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, what the ACLU is for those who care about civil liberties. Why would the premier gay legal organization insist that our bill, the first in the country to give full equality to gay couples, be withdrawn? Well, Paul confided in me that it's because they didn't write it. The NIH problem, the not invented here problem. How could Lambda Legal Defense Fund raise all this money from gay people and people who support gay rights all across the country? They are the premier leaders. They are the people defending gay rights. How could they advertise if two gay lawyers in Los Angeles could write a bill without needing Lambda's help. They insisted that Paul Koretz withdraw the legislation and instead replace it with one that Lambda had written, one that gave six legal rights to gay people. I think hospital visitation was one of them. Six. Ours conferred more than 2,000. 1,000 at the state level, 1,000 at the federal level. Theirs conferred six. I was... Very upset. I remember calling Jenny Pfizer with the Land of Legal Defense Fund and asking her what the heck was her problem. And she said, well, I just don't think America's ready. I don't think California's ready. I said, look, I don't care whether they're ready or not. Ready or not, here we come. Let's start with full marriage equality. And if that gives us 45% of the legislative votes, and to get that extra 5%, we have to cut back some, we'll cut back then. But you don't start by saying we have no right to equality and give us pl six rights, please. You start by saying we are full and equal citizens of the United States. We deserve full equality under the law. And then if we have to cut back on full equality to get the, legislate, the, 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 the law passed, fine. She said, sorry, no can do. I said, look, Jenny, I know what's going on here. I know Lambda wants credit. So I'll make you a deal, all right? You can put it forward as Lambda's bill. You can endorse our bill. You can even call it the Lambda bill. Just put on that Jim and I wrote it along with Lambda, even though we both know you didn't write any of it. Put it down as a Lambda bill. We can all support it together. Let's all be on the same side here. And she said no. Went back to Paul. He said, you know, Lambda was a big supporter of his. They're in premature matters. They're the ones who say to uh, gay people who they should vote for. He represents West Hollywood, which has a high gay population. And if Lambda isn't supporting him, he might not win his next election. Boy, did I learn a hard truth that day. I learned that organizations that purport to support things often are more concerned about their own organizations than they are about the people they care about supporting. To this day, I have never given a penny to Lambda Legal Defense Fund, and I urge you not to give a penny to Lambda Legal Defense Fund ever. Because of this, I realize that there are some people that have changed. Jenny Pfizer, I believe, is still there. And I realize that they support full marriage equality now. I get it. But the fact that they were willing to put their organization above gay people's lives tells me something about that organization. And I got to say, this I don't mean to only pick on them. I've heard this about organizations that support all kinds of progressive and conservative causes. I don't have personal experience with those other ones, so I can't name them by name. But I can't tell you how many stories I've heard of hearsay. This organization claims to support X, the environment, civil rights, unions. But they care more about their organization and raising money than they do about the actual cause. And when Lambda said, screw gay people of California, we don't give a damn about gay equality. We care more about our organization being seen as in the forefront of gay equality than actually helping gay people. It, it was a shocker to me. It really was. Poor Paul Koretz. I don't blame him. 
I don't blame him at all. So, after introducing the bill, he pulled it. He put in the Lambda-approved and written bill. Gay people in California got six rights. I think it included hospital visitation. Rather than striving for full marriage equality. And I say this story just so you see how far we've come. In 13 years, we've come from even a gay rights organization not willing to support a full civil unions bill to the majority of Americans nationwide supporting full marriage equality. Actually, I'm proud to say that the four of us, LJ, Bruce, Lisa, and me, were very clear that we wanted to call our organization marriage equality, not gay marriage. Please, no one progressive don't use the term gay marriage there's no such thing as a gay marriage it's a marriage it may be a gay couple it's a marriage gay marriages aren't any different from straight marriages it's just that gay people are in the marriage you know when slaves were first given permission to marry they called them slave marriages not marriages or marriages of slaves or marriages of African Americans. But slave marriages is just to suggest they weren't real marriages. They weren't normal marriages. They were slave marriages. When blacks and whites tried to get married in the 1960s, and it was illegal, they called it miscegenation, which means race mixing. They didn't call it, by its proper term, marriage. Were Barack Obama's parents in a miscegenation? Or were they in a marriage? Gay couples do not want to get gay married. They want to get married. Just like straight couples do. So I understand maybe you haven't heard the term. The proper term is marriage equality. Please use that term. It's about equality of marriage under the law. It ain't about gay married. Because gay married aren't gay married any more than black people are black married or white and black couples are miscegenation, or older people are elderly married. They're all marriages. They all have the rights to equality under the law. So how did we get from 2000, where even gay rights organizations won't support full equality civil unions, to 2013, where the United States Supreme Court recognizes the will of the majority of Americans across the nation who support full marriage equality for all gay citizens. That story when we come back. If you want to call in, it's 202-889-9797. 202-889-9797. This is Mark Levine. This is the Inside Scoop. Follow me on Twitter at Mark Levine Talk. Check out my website at marklevinetalk.com where you'll see I go on national TV and international TV and talk about some of these issues. Or just uh, tweet at me. Let me know what your thoughts are on this show. You can also comment on my website, marklevinetalk.com. We'll be right back with more of the Inside Scoop right after this. Listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, WeActRadio.com. Take Action News with David Schuster, Saturdays from 12 to 3 on We Act Radio, 1480 AM, and WeActRadio.com. Well, for me, it's always been you know, you report the facts, you report like hell, let the chips fall where they may, and the truth ultimately. The truth ultimately is what's going to sort of help our society and help all of us. I don't think progressives want a thumb on the scale on the facts. They just want the facts out there. You let the facts out and progressives will tell you, you know, we're going to win 70% of the time. 
Uh, you may quibble with the, the percentages or whatnot, but I think that's just sort of what progressives are looking for, and I think that's where this all sort of meshes with, with my interest as a journalist. And my interest, interest as a journalist is report the facts, here's what's going on, here's what the facts say, here's what history says, here are the lessons we know we have learned, and let people draw their own conclusions. And I think what's so unfortunate right now in the world of broadcast media is I do think that uh, a lot of conservative radio, certainly conservative television, they're not interested in facts. And that's ultimately where I think conservative media is going to have its downfalls, that Americans are hungry. They're just hungry for basic information, hungry for basic facts. You report like hell, you let the chips fall where they may. I think it's, it's natural for all of us who care, who are passionate about politics, who feel like we have a sense about the difference between right and wrong. I think it's okay to let that be part of your coverage. It's important for all of us as broadcasters and journalists. In this day and age, we have to be authentic. You can't be the person who's up in the ivory tower that comes down and tells people, now you must eat your peas. No, it's all about, we all have personalities, and I think it's being aware sometimes of our own bias, but also being open to the idea that sometimes we're wrong, but we have a dialogue, and we have a passionate dialogue, and we care about this country, we care about this community, and I think that sort of passion is what carries us through. Hear more from David Schuster, Saturdays from 12 to 3 on Take Action News, on We Act Radio, 1480 AM, and weactradio.com. Hello, this is Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and I want to tell you about my new favorite discovery, Yosemite National Park. I recently went there with my husband and children, and we walked the trails to see the breathtaking waterfalls, admired the grand meadows, and giant sequoias. But the future of our national parks is uncertain. Many challenges face our parks today, from polluted air and water to development threats outside their borders and inadequate funding to protect our national heritage. That's why the National Parks Conservation Association recently completed a decade-long assessment of the challenges facing our national parks, along with proposed actions that will ensure our children and grandchildren will be able to enjoy the parks as we have. Our national parks have inspired Americans for nearly 100 years. As we approach the centennial of the National Park Service in 2016, please join us in helping to protect our national park legacy. Find out how at www.npca.org. You're listening to WPWC We Act Radio, 1480 AM, weactradio.com. Welcome back to the Inside Scoop. I'm your host, Mark Levine. So in uh, 2000, I was not uh, the happiest Californian. I uh, had just, uh, we just lost Proposition 22, 62 to 38. They had, the California people, people of California had voted against uh, gay rights. Um, and of course, the campaign, the gay, I wasn't even that uh, happy with the gay community because the people who opposed the night initiative as I did didn't want to show the reality of gay people's lives. I disagree with them on that. And then I drafted California's first civil unions bill and uh, it was thrown out because a gay rights organization hadn't invented it themselves. So I wish I could say that that was the cause of me leaving California in a huff. The reality is, of course, I care about a lot more than gay rights, as you know, if you listen to the Inside Scoop every week from 1 to 3 uh, at marklevinetalk.com and on We Act Radio, AM 1480. And I got actively involved in following Bush v. Gore. That's a story for another day. It's a long story. Many of you have heard it before. Uh, but basically, I followed it from all the time that I called uh, in the Buchanan Spike in Palm Beach, Florida to CNN that election night to calling the Gore campaign, asking him not to concede, uh, to following all the legal action and then writing about it after the Supreme Court came in. I'm not claiming I'm the only one who caught the Buchanan spike or the only one who told Gore to, not to concede. There were thousands of us who did so, but that was my tiny role in that. And then, of course, after I wrote uh, an email uh, called The Layman's Guide to Bush v. Gore about uh, how the Supreme Court had stolen the election of 2000, I was hired by the Congressional Black Caucus to draft the brief challenging the Florida electors, and I was hired by Congressman Barney Frank to work for him on the House Judiciary Committee, Homeland Security Committee, Financial Services Committee, um, and I came and I moved to Washington. So I left California and I left the marriage equality debate for a while. 
But of course, working for Barney Frank, openly gay congressman, the issue of gay rights was never too far from the consciousness. And uh, soon after came the dramatic 2003 Lawrence v. Texas decision, when Justice Kennedy joined with the four liberals and I believe Justice Senator Day O'Connor at that time in saying, guess what? You can't throw people in jail for having oral sex, private consenting adults. If a married couple wants to have oral sex, you know what? Leave them alone. This is America. We don't throw people in jail because we don't like the way they have sex. If we did, I think we could throw millions of people in jail. Big case. And as Justice Scalia pointed out in the dissent of that case, if you treat gay couples having sex the same as straight couples having sex, sooner or later, you're going to have to pretend that gay people have all the rights that straight people have, including the right to, to get married. And he said that as a parade of horribles, as a slippery slope. Treat, Don't throw gay people in jail, and the next thing you know, they're going to want the same right to marry that straight people have. Scalia was right. And indeed, uh, the finding of Lawrence v. Texas would eventually lead to the finding uh, just Wednesday. The Defense of Marriage Act is unconstitutional. So Lawrence v. Texas happened. That was exciting. It was now legal for people to have oral sex in my home state of Virginia. Before then, it was illegal. And then came the big case, the Goodrich case. Massachusetts Supreme Court said that gay couples there would have full and equal rights to marry. First state in the United States. It wasn't the first place in the world. Uh, some Scandinavian countries and the Netherlands have been giving civil unions and domestic partnerships and limited rights to gay couples dating back to 1989. And by 2000, the Netherlands, and I believe Belgium too, became the first countries in the world to have full marriage equality. Uh, I got a caller on the line. Uh, oh, let's take the call. Let's see if it... Hi there. Welcome to the Inside Scoop. Hey, Mark. Michael. <laughs> Hello again. I just Hello. said I didn't get a chance to talk about other topics. I will. I will next week. I know you want to talk about uh, Trayvon Martin, some other things, but uh, I was just concluding my story about marriage equality. So, uh, right. if if it's on that topic, go right ahead. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you to to save it for next week. Yeah. No. No. I know we'll, we'll talk about that. Stuff, okay. Um, other stuff next week. But as far as just what you were pointing out, yeah. That Texas case that you pointed out, Lawrence v. Texas. Lawrence, yeah. You are a doggone genius. You know why? Why? <laughs> Because you have exposed further the hypocrisy of the right wingers. It is so, I am so beside myself that they will worry about how people um, spend private, intimate moments with each other. And notice how I'm using that term strongly but broadly. Yeah. Because we don't need to go into any specific. No, but they want to spy on us in our bedrooms. That's exactly yeah, what they want to do. They want to spy on us in our bedrooms. And it, you know, if 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 again, if, if if there's no violence being committed, if it's all consensual, it's between adults. Leave us alone. It goes much, it goes much more than that. All right. They want they want to spy in our bedrooms, which is a violation of right to privacy. That's true. But yet, they don't want to touch base upon people like Mark Sanford, people like Rudy Giuliani, who engage in extramarital affairs yep. and doing so at the expense of taxpayers dollars well you let know, me they, let me i want to be clear about that i i if it's at the expense of taxpayer dollars then i do right. think we have a right to know for example if somebody uses taxpayer money to pay off their mistress uh that which by the way um no, actually, alexander hamilton did that way back uh, 200 some years ago so this is nothing new but to the extent that a politician is involved in extramarital affair uh that doesn't involve taxpayer money you know bill clinton for example you know, I I think that's a yeah. private matter between between a, uh, a married couple. Yeah, I just want to emphasize that that indeed was a private matter. It did not involve taxpayers' dollars. Right, exactly. But then, when you had somebody like Sanford, when you have somebody like Giuliani going on these um, weekend or vacation liaisons with their mistresses and using taxpayer dollars to pay for the cost of lodgings or whatever for whatever the devil that they did. You know, you cannot do that. That is against the law. That is a crime. And to this very day, not one of them, because they're Republican, have ever been held accountable well, when they should. Yeah, Senator David Vitter of Louisiana, who admitted to seeing prostitutes, which is, of course, against the law uh, yeah. in, in, uh, in, in Louisiana. Now, of course, um, uh, Elliot Spitzer, governor of New York, 
Uh, he he did not use taxpayer money. He did see prostitutes, and he resigned. But David Vitter remains a senator in Louisiana today. So you're absolutely he was right. Forced that, to resign. That, yeah, there's a double standard. Well, he was forced to, but no one forced David Vitter to resign. Right. He's, he's still right. in Congress today. Okay, I, I want to just finish up. I only got ten minutes left, so I'm. Yeah, I'm, I just had to call back. Fair and enough. You know of that. Okay, thanks for calling, Michael. I always appreciate when you do. All, All right. right, so just to finish the story because I, I do want to do that in just the uh, ten minutes or so I have left. Uh, Massachusetts passed. This is the first, excuse me, I should say that the Massachusetts Supreme Court uh, says that under the Massachusetts Constitution, gay couples have the same equal rights to marry that straight couples do. Again, there's a huge backlash. There's a huge election in 2004. It's very close between Bush and Kerry. If a few votes in Ohio had been switched, uh, Kerry would have been the president in 2004. And one of the big things that Republicans pushed in 2004 is all these anti-gay marriage uh, constitutional amendments and, and, and ballot measures because they feel like the majority of Americans oppose full marriage equality, which they did in 2004, and they're going to get a lot of votes. They're going to get out all these socially conservative votes. George Bush even supports a, an amendment to the federal constitution, the first amendment in American history that would, rather, that would restrict freedoms rather than expand them. You know, every other amendment to the Constitution expanded human freedoms. The Bill of Rights expands human freedoms. Uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments that allowed African Americans to be full citizens, to ban slavery, to vote, expanded human freedoms. The right of women to vote expanded human freedoms. The right of 18-year-olds to vote uh, in 1971, um, giving electoral votes to the District of Columbia, whatever it is, every single other amendment to the Constitution expanded human freedoms expanded the right to vote, this would contract it. This would put inequality permanently in our federal constitution. And they almost had the votes to pass it. Luckily, it required a two-thirds vote in both houses. Didn't quite get that. And in Massachusetts, luckily, it's hard to change that constitution as well. People tried to change the Massachusetts constitution, and they didn't get enough votes to do that. So everyone was ready. Okay, Massachusetts allows gay couples. And everyone was waiting, at least the social conservatives, for Massachusetts families to disintegrate, for people to stop getting married, straight people too. And lo and behold, ho-hum, Massachusetts couples got married. Ruth didn't cave in. God didn't strike down Massachusetts with hurricanes. Straight couples continued to get married and divorced. Gay couples too. They all raised children. Pretty normal. Pretty normal. And so four years later, Connecticut in 2008 became the second state. And then, well, they just started going one after the other. Vermont switched from civil unions to marriage. We had New Hampshire. Uh, we had uh, Iowa's court held that. And then Maryland. And, and uh, I was very proud of working on the, the District of Columbia's marriage equality statute. In fact, once we passed it in the D.C. legislature, the D.C. City Council, District of Columbia, uh, the people who opposed it actually tried to bring it to a referendum to vote on. And I said, you can't do it in D.C. Because D.C. had a human rights statute, dates back to the 70s, that says you cannot discriminate on the basis of a sexual orientation. And more importantly, you can't vote on whether or not to discriminate. You can vote on all kinds of things. You can vote on tax issues. You can vote on the lottery. You can vote on schools, parks. Bring that to the people if you want, to direct democracy. But you cannot have a vote on minority rights. The majority should never vote on minority rights. If there's anything we learned from the civil rights movement, when the majority of Alabamians and Mississippians voted to deny African Americans equal rights under the law, a majority should never vote on minority rights. Equality is non-negotiable. You can't say, oh, well, you know, 70% of Mississippi is white and 30% is black. And so 70% of whites are going to determine that the 30% have no rights. You just can't do that. And I went to court, I'm proud to say, as counsel for the Gertrude Stein Democratic Club, the um, longest, I believe the longest gay Democratic club in the United States, longest serving or the first or maybe the second. Anyway, I went to court. Um, later on, I had the same trouble with gay rights organizations I did in California. They said, you can't, individual lawyer, go to court to defend this very important case. And uh, we need something big, like some big gay rights organization with lots of money to come in and lots of lawyers. And they went in and basically um, defended what I had already done. But the point is, I went 
and I did the groundwork, and I defended it in court. And I worked with Phil Mendelson, who's a wonderful city councilman who I hope one day is mayor of the District of Columbia, mayor of Washington, D.C. He worked with me. We worked very hard to protect religious freedoms because no one wants to require synagogues and churches and mosques to marry anyone they don't want to marry. I believe in full religious freedom under the First Amendment. Heck, a church can even be racist. I won't like that church. But if they want to only marry whites or blacks or uh, the Catholic Church doesn't want to marry Catholics and Protestants or whatever, that's fine. Religions have the right to marry whomever they want. I don't care what religions do to the people who are in their religions because people can enter or leave religions. But the state has to be equal to all. I worked with Phil Mendelson drafting that legislation, making it into law, advocating for it. You can still see my testimony on behalf of the uh, marriage equality bill. Um, that's online on my website, marklevingtalk.com, and then defending it in court. And I'm proud to say we won it in D.C. and Maryland and then in New York and Rhode Island, Minnesota, Washington State. Maine changed its mind a couple times. And there are 12 states, and then, of course, with the end of Proposition 8, California became Wednesday the 13th state. Now 30% of Americans live in states that allow full equality for gay couples. What happened in the Proposition 8 case? Well, like the defense of marriage case, basically times have changed. Californians sued and said, so what happened in 2008? Uh, there was yet another proposition, not like Proposition 22, that said that gay couples could not marry. And Proposition 8, and I wasn't involved in that campaign. I wasn't living in California at the time. I sent them a bunch of money to the anti-Prop 8 campaign. But to their credit, they at least began using, in some ads, showing real gay couples, real gay lives. And although we lost Proposition 8 in 2008, we lost it by 52 to 48. Remember, we lost Prop 22 eight years earlier, 62 to 38. That means that 10% of Californians changed their mind in just eight years. Maybe because they saw in Massachusetts no harm, no foul to allow gay couples to marry. But we still lost, and Californians were very bitter and upset. And they took it up to the California Supreme Court. The California Supreme Court said, hey, you know, gay couples have a right to marry. That Proposition 8 was a constitutional amendment to overturn the California Supreme Court decision. So then they took it up under the federal constitution and said, you know what? The 14th Amendment of the Constitution right here says that every state has to give their citizens equal protection under the laws. And a federal district court judge in California said, you know what? You're right. You're right. Not allowing gay couples full equality is a violation of the federal constitution. David Boies and Ted Olson took it all up to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court um, took the case, but by the time they took the case, California officials weren't ready to even defend their own law. The governor of California, the attorney general of California, two great men who said, you know what? This is unconstitutional. We don't believe in discrimination. We're not going to defend this law. So the Supreme Court saw an out. They said, well, if Californians don't support this law, then I'll find we won't take it. The lower court holds it's unconstitutional. And by doing so, they very carefully said that California has marriage equality, but not the 37 states that don't have it yet. It's my prediction that that will happen. There will be full marriage equality throughout the United States within another 10 years, probably sooner. And I base that on the fact that in 1948, California was the first state to say that interracial marriage bans were unconstitutional. And 19 years later, in Loving Me, Virginia, in 1967, they said, all right, that means that uh, no state can ban interracial marriages. I take those 19 years, I add them to the uh, Massachusetts case in 2004, and I say by 2023, 10 years from today, there will be full marriage equality across the United States. 10 years ago was the first state, 10 years from now will be the last state. I'm proud of the small role that I paid in the process, and I hope I've given a little bit of encouragement to all of you fighting for whatever goals you believe in, whether it be environments or uh, reinstituting the Voting Rights Act, whether it being for unions or fair wages, whatever you, your cause. Never doubt, as Margaret Mead once said, never doubt that a small group of committed activists can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. 
Well, that's the inside scoop I have on both what I did and what happened in the United States Supreme Court. If you have a comment, go to my website, marklevingtalk.com, and feel free to leave the comments there. Uh, follow me on Twitter at Mark Living Talk and listen to me every Sunday, Rockus Caucus, noon to one, and the inside scoop, one to three Eastern time. For now, though, this is Mark Levine, and I'm signing off.